So we are doing this um, podcast where we, we discuss with researchers um, their own trajectories and careers so we can give advice you know, to younger uh, students who want to go into academia. And so um, can you tell me um, uh, in the first place how you decided to become an academic and became interested in topics such as China? I can uh, tell you that um, I started out in U.S., Latin American, and film history mm -hmm. at San Diego State. I followed my husband to University of Hawaii, where I obtained a master's degree in Vietnamese history. But the moment when I decided to get a Ph.D. was when they put me in the classroom. So uh, I actually do it backwards because I want to get a PhD to teach college students because I love the students and I love learning and, uh, and I hope I, I have my students learn, I engage them. Uh, so I kind of have an interesting trajectory there. In addition, I then go, went from University of Hawaii where I did a thesis on Ho Chi Minh and Lao Din Siam and learned Vietnamese for three years to the University of Chicago where I obtained a doctorate in Chinese history. And again, I like studying revolution and revolutionaries, and I studied the Chinese who went to France during the 1920s, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, uh, and a host of others. Uh, at that stage, uh, I obtained my degree from the University of Chicago in 1985. I then was the first foreigner to go to Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, to go to the social science division. I had over 20 interviews in four months with uh, everyone I'm from imprisoned, <laughs> imprisoned Trotskyists. I uh, was the first one to interview Zhang Chaolin, very, very famous. And one of the founders of the French Communist Party, Shang Chang, for example, mm -hmm. who Romain Rolin gave an introduction to uh, his book, Ma Mère, in 1930. I also interviewed the husband of a woman who wrote a thesis on André Gide, who wrote to her a personal letter saying, I had never been so well understood. Because I had the Vietnamese background, I went to the colonial archives here in Aix-en-Provence for three weeks, and I found 200 cartons of material for Chinese, because guess what? The Sûreté wanted to know what the Chinese were doing, because they might be influencing the Vietnamese. So. Uh, uh, how I became interested in Chinese was that uh, when we went to Hawaii, uh, Latin America was not an option to study. Uh, so I went into Asia, Vietnam, but then I realized that uh, it was a too narrow and I had to expand. So I never ate Chinese food and I never had an interest in China. But once I began to learn Chinese culture and to speak Chinese, my Chinese is fluent. Uh, I just love it. So I've written articles in Chinese, I give lectures in Chinese, I interview Chinese, and I ended up doing two projects. One is a Chinese biographical database, the first online web moder scholarly moderated database, 1996 uh, to about 2008 to 2006. And uh, I also did these interviews which are being transcribed and have written two books about uh, 48 articles, and again have been translated into French and Chinese. Okay. I've been privileged, very privileged by the French people to be invited to numerous uh, conferences, uh, and uh, the Chinese as well. Okay. Probably long-winded, I apologize. No, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so um, what did you learn from this first research experience, go, going into uh, you know, this task of trying to make your first work and your first contribution? Like, what, what did you learn from this experience? Well, I, I actually uh, learned that uh, you cannot prepare an, uh, enough, and uh, it, I, I actually sort of knew that intuitively. So going to France and not speaking French and expecting to do research, uh, I, I actually researched how to do research in the French archives. So uh, it was tremendously helpful. I was able to get a carte de lecture everywhere. I learned that people will live up to your high expectations. 
And I learned that the French people are wonderful. I learned that there's all these stereotypes out there, and you just need to be polite and try to learn the language. So the one phrase I learned was, je ne veux pas uh, vous déranger, je suis désolée, je ne veux pas vous déranger. You have no idea how this helped people understand that I thought I was an idiot, but that maybe they would be helpful to me, and they always were helpful. So I learned that every single culture had wonderful people. I think in all my years of research, I've maybe had two bad encounters internationally. Uh, so uh, I was a little frightened because I couldn't speak French. I could only speak Chinese, but mm -hmm. again, it seemed to work. French people can only speak French. So and, yeah. and the other thing, what I, what I learned specifically about research in France was that the French are a little fragmented. Uh, when you go to the Ecole d'Altitude in Sciences Sociales, I also was invited to be a scholar there after many years. And what I learned was that no one knows what anyone is doing. So you go to one little area, and so, so what my role was to unite everyone <laughs> and to create harmony. I mean, there I am, my first two weeks in France, I find 200 cartons of Chinese material in uh, the Archie National Suction Dudemer, back then it was in Paris as well. And uh, there I am invited to give a speech. Uh, and 60 people came to hear it because uh, I always share what I, I learn. I shared the carton numbers, and uh, we're all on the same page wanting the truth. Mm -hmm. So I learned to stick to your own values, to be who you really are, and people will accept you for who you are. Yeah, so those are very good like, human uh, experiences that you, you got from this. Center. I had so many adventures, it's not even funny. Little yeah. old men would walk over and offer me materials. This is my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and and so, uh, what did, uh, I, I noticed that you, you worked on a lot of, uh, of political issues. Like, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, how, did, did you need to approach this specifically in a specifically different way as other academic issues? or? Uh, um, you well, know, because those were, were, could be sure. tied to you know public uh, debates. And, uh, well, I think it's in a matter of ethics. Mm. Uh, you want to be uh, cautious. Uh, I was the first foreigner to go to Tsinghua, and they hadn't had a lot of foreigners, and I did not want to set the pattern of an exploiter. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, when they showed me materials, I, I, I every, did everything officially, and I took notes, but I refused to photocopy. Mm -hmm. the material, because one doesn't know. The Chinese have been through so much pain, especially the intellectuals, mm -hmm. and if I could cause them any trouble, I would not want to do it. And so, uh, or things you learn that could be politically sensitive, because people will, will talk to me very naturally, and I want to protect them. So yeah, there's some things you learn, and some things, you know, that uh, I had certainly enough materials <laughs> from the French archives, and the Chinese archives, and the Taiwan archives, uh, I went to nine different archives, and, and I had enough material that I could make my case, but once in a while, you know, you, you have a sensitive piece of information, and you have to ask yourself, how important is this to the narrative mm -hmm. that you're telling? And if it's not important, don't put it in if it could hurt someone. But I always was very careful to stay away from political discussion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in probably all those three decades, I maybe had uh, three to four political kind of arguments, but uh, those were interesting. Yeah, do you think it's a, it's a pitfall that, that you, we have to avoid when we, when we talk about these issues? Be very careful. You have to be super yeah. careful, and I'll tell you the reason why is because you leave and walk out the door and fly back to your country. These people have to live with having mm -hmm. talked to a foreigner. Mm -hmm. And if they're suspected of uh, you know, anything, it could be mm -hmm. true or not, then that's wrong. So, you know, be yourself, be friendly, but also be cautious that whatever comes out of your mouth, uh, somebody overhears it, and you could be getting people in trouble. So I'm very sensitive uh, to that. So, so I take it by hearing all the names that you gave us, that the notion of elite is, is important in your work, like the notion of uh, today's workshop. Uh, I think, uh, actually, uh, of course, uh, you could, I guess you could call Deng Xiaoping the elite, uh, mm -hmm. Zhou Enlai, uh, Li Fuchuan, Sai Chang, Mia Rinjian. Mm -hmm. But uh, 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 I guess I think of it more as revolutionary leaders. And I, mm -hmm. I, actually, I'm interested in the non-elites in my research right now. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in those middle people who, who made the history. Mm -hmm. Who really did it? Well, a lot of people did it. 
I'm particularly uh, finding how insignificant Mount Sedum was in the networks that I'm studying that come out of France and uh, the Soviet Union. It's a really interesting finding uh, in terms of the centrality measures. Uh, and it, I'm really looking forward to the feedback tomorrow. But to not avoid your, your question, yes, I guess one could characterize uh, them as a form of elites. I don't think they thought of themselves that way. Uh, I think the better question is, is uh, because it's my concept of leadership, is the empowerment of, of all people and, and the empowerment of people to be leaders. And so I don't just view the top rung. I view 2,114 people. Mm -hmm. That's in my database. Yeah. And so, um, what, what is your, your feedback on today's workshop? Uh, what do you think are the most Oh my gosh, things? it was merveilleux. <laughs> <laughs> merveilleux. Uh, everybody was just so brilliant. Uh, well, it's, it's intimidating because <laughs> I have to go first tomorrow, yeah. Uh, well, who can say? But uh, I'm very excited uh, by the methodologies that people are pioneering. Uh, by their uh, uh, tem temerity to get the uh, to get the results out there and to make conclusions, you know, one of the nice things about network analysis and about all of this is that you go where the data leads you. You don't a priori make a decision. And all of these people, whether they did microhistory, macrohistory, or quantitative history, let the data determine who they were. For example, James Lee talked about. Uh, 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 where all the very significant database work they were doing provided information about women in STEM. It was really, really good. And um, uh, I hope to be sharing with people my own work so that, you know, particularly if, if I have relevant people in my database, uh, to help them uh, if I can. And so to, to finish, uh, do you have like, some advice for young people who want to go into academia? Um, well, personally, I think it is the most fun thing <laughs> on earth. I have the advice for anybody about anything. I'll even take, Sasha, your question and, and, and expand it a bit. I say don't do anything in your life unless A, you can be of service to others, and B, have fun. And I give a lot of internships to, to people who think they want to be in academe, and I let them teach with me at the undergraduate level and see if their temperament is good for it. But um, yeah, I think because of my own thought, I really, really do like uh, uh, academe, and it's a very, very high, high profession. The uh, difficulty is, is society right now has a disconnect with higher education because there's so much careerism and materialism and lack of attention to the life of the mind in the world, not, not in any one country in the world right now. We're facing a little bit of a crisis, but um, can I say one positive thing? Mm -hmm. And that is that the reason why I believe it's a sustainable model and it's a sustainable profession, and I encourage anybody to look at it seriously, um, is that uh, you have in young people l'espoir. You have the hope is in our young people. Uh, I was, uh, 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 even at my age, I just, I just love the students. There's an inclination to not like the music or to say, oh, your language is uh, bad or something, or you don't like to read. But as good teachers, we can trick them into reading and into writing and into doing good work and projects. We just need to be a little innovative and engage our students, but they are sharp, they're smart, they're willing to work if you give them good work to challenge them, but they're the ones, they're the hope. The Greta Thunberg isn't the only one. There's so many people out there uh, willing to put their phones away and pay attention and, and be good students. Mm -hmm.